Glad to be here the, today, and we trust the Lord will bless the meeting tonight. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 55, please. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 55, and I want to read two well-known verses, very well-known verses indeed. And you can perhaps quote them as we read the verses. I'm always thrilled when I go to visit, especially some of the older folks, and you say, you spend a while chatting to them, you say, I'm going to read and pray, and you start to read somewhere, and just as you're reading there, just quoting it word for word for you, and the old folks seem to know the scriptures better than the young folks, unfortunately. So it's good for us to learn the word of God and what an encouragement it is. But these are verses that you might know and we're going to read them together, please. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 6, first of all. Isaiah 55 and verse 6 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. We know that the Lord will bless the public reading of his own precious, infallible, inerrant truth. When we come to the Word of God, we discover that in the Word of God there are many, many commands. I don't know how many there are. There are thousands of commands in the Word of God. And there are also many, many promises in the Word of God. And again, I don't know how many promises there are, but there are many, many, many promises in the Word of God. And the little passage that we have read tonight, it begins with a command and it ends with a promise. And when we go into the Hebrew and all this, and I'm not very clever, but there's other people can do these things for us. But if you look at the first phrase in verse 6, it says, Seek ye the Lord. And that's written in what's called the imperative tense. In other words, that's a command from the Lord. The little word ye in your Bible there is a plural word. The words thee and thou and thine are all singular words. And the word ye and you are plural words. So this is a command that brings in everybody. It's not just for me or for you uh, individuals. It's not just for maybe very bad people or very religious people. This is a command for everybody. God is commanding us to seek the Lord while he may be found. And then down at the end of verse 7, you've got a promise. And this promise is written in what's called the indicative tense. It's, you know, the police talk about having an indictment against somebody. They've gathered up information and they've got facts together. It's an indictment. This is written in the indicative tense, and this is a promise. And it says, for he will abundantly pardon. You've got a command, seek ye the Lord, and you've got a promise, for he will abundantly pardon. Now, if you put the two together, if you put the command and the promise, you've just got the gospel. Seek ye the Lord, for he will abundantly pardon. That's what's on offer in the gospel meeting tonight. If you're not saved, if you've never trusted the Lord Jesus as your Savior, that's what's on offer. There's an abundant pardon on offer tonight. God wants to do away with all your sins. He wants to cleanse you with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. He wants to write your name into the Lamb's Book of Life, and he wants to guarantee you a place in heaven. That's what's on offer in the gospel meeting tonight. You can have that for nothing if you seek the Lord while he may be found, for he will abundantly pardon. Now, there are no hidden costs. If you glance over to the end of verse 1 in chapter 55, it says, come without money and without price. There are no hidden costs. We're living in days of scam. And not that long ago, this woman rang me up. She said, Mr. Wilson, congratulations, you've won five million pounds. And I says, well, you know my phone number. You're bound to know my address. Just send it on to me. And I hung up on her. But it was a whole scam. You see, you had to ring back, and it would cost you about 50 pounds to ring back. But there was small print. But there's no small print here. If you seek the Lord, he will abundantly pardon. There's no small print. There's no hidden costs. There's no religious requirements. It's not saying you, you've got to start to go to church or you've got to start doing this or that or go through ceremonies. There's no religious requirements. Seek ye the Lord, for he will abundantly pardon. There's no hidden costs. There's no religious requirements. And there's no limits to it. Seek ye the Lord, for he will abundantly pardon. The Lord wants to forgive you tonight. He wants to take away your sins. Now, what I was thinking about is what is an abundant pardon? What does it mean to be abundantly pardoned? I know sometimes, uh, this is human nature anyway, and maybe somebody did something on you and you've thought about it for a while and maybe you stewed for a while and maybe you were angry for a wee while and then you would have said to them, look, 
I forgive you. And that's fair enough for talking, but if they did it again, you would say, that's the second time you've done that. In other words, I haven't really forgiven you at all. And that's what we are like. We don't really forgive people. We only say we forgive them, but we don't really forgive them. But when God says, I will abundantly pardon, what does God mean? What, what does God want to give you tonight if you're not saved? Well, I want you to come with me to the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians, chapter 2 and verse 14. And I want us to see what an abundant pardon really, really is. This is not human pardon. This is the pardon and the grace and the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what an abundant pardon is. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. <clears throat> Take your time and find the place. I remember many years ago sitting in Cook Baptist Church. That's where I came from. And I was only saved a, a while. And Pastor McFarland there, John McFarland, he gave out Colossians one Sunday morning, I couldn't find it. And the sweat was blinding me, and it was as red as a beetroot, and I was wondering what people were saying, that fellow must be stupid, he doesn't know where Colossians is. And maybe you don't know where it is, but take time and find it anyway. It's in the New Testament, and it's in around the middle of the New Testament, and if you get to Philippines, you'll get to Colossians. And that Sunday I went home, and I learned all the books of the Bible. And I wrote them all down, and I couldn't spell them like, but I wrote them down what I thought was near enough right, and I learned them again. And even now, if somebody said Amos or Obadiah, you'd still have trouble finding it because you get into a bit of a fluster in church sometimes. So take time and find the place. I want you to see what this says. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. Here's what it says. It says, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now, that verse is describing what an abundant pardon really is. First of all, it says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Now, if you're in the meeting tonight and you're not saved, and we're really, really glad to see you, and people have been praying for you that you might get saved tonight. But if you're not saved, there's a book in heaven, and it's handwriting of ordinances that are against you. In other words, every law of God that you've ever broken is written down in that book. Every sin that you've ever committed is written down in that book. Every wrong thought that you've ever had and every wrong deed that you've ever done, everything is written down in that book. That's what's called the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. And the reason I know that is true is because when you come to the Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12, and our brother was praying about judgment tonight, and we find there what we call the great white throne judgment. Revelation 20 verse 11 says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat upon it, from whose face the heavens and the earth fled away, and there was found no place for them. And you can see these people, and they're standing around this great white throne, and there's no place for them. There's no hiding place. There's no safe place. There's no place for them. And verse 12 says, And I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books. This is what I'm talking about now. The books were opened. It's plural. It's books. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. So you can see the books and the book are there. And then it says, and the dead were judged out of the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. See, if you die without the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, of course, you'll be buried and your soul will go immediately into hell and then when this great white throne judgment comes, d death and hell give up the dead which are in it, and the sea give up the dead which is in them. And you'll get some sort of a body. I don't know what kind of a body it is, but some sort of a body to stand before God. And this book, your book, with all your broken sins and all your broken laws will be read out. And down in verse 15 of Revelation chapter 20, it says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, now remember in verse 12 it said, and I saw the dead, small and great. In other words, they're all dead people. They're all sinners lost. And you're looking through the book of life for dead people and you can't find them. It's a sort of a fruitless search, isn't it? And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And dear friend, if your book is not blotted out, you'll be cast into the lake of fire. But if you seek the Lord tonight, something wonderful will happen. Because if you look at verse 14 there, it says, 
That book with all your sins and all your uh, transgressions and all the iniquity that you've ever committed, it's going to be blotted out, blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us. That's the first part of the abundant part. God will take your book with all your sins, all the things that maybe you never thought were sins and all the, the sins that you've forgotten about. God's going to take that book wherein they're all recorded and he's going to blot it out. He's not going to just close it. He's not going to tie a sort of a ribbon about it, put it up on the shelf. No, he's going to blot it out. That's the first thing that happens. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Now, you'd think that would be enough, but look what it says. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that were against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way. Not only does he blot it out, but he takes it out of the way. He wouldn't need to take it out of the way because it's already blotted out. All the writing is blotted out. There's nothing in the book anymore once you get saved. But just in case you would think, well, I'm a wee bit on dodgy ground, he not only blots it out, but he takes it out of the way. Now, you may ask the question, well, where does he put it then? Where does the Lord put it? Well, Isaiah 38 and verse 17 says that thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. So first of all, he puts it out of sight. It's behind his back. And then Micah chapter 7 verse 19 says, thou hast cast all my sins into the depths of the sea. He puts it out of reach. And then Hebrews 10, 17 says, thy sins and thy iniquities will I remember no more. And he puts it out of mind. And you're beginning to see what an abundant pardon is. First of all, the book is blotted out and then it's taken out of the way. It's, it's put out of sight and out of reach and out of mind. And then look what it says in verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Not only does he blot it out, and not only does he take it out of the way, but he nails it to the cross. I want you to picture the scene. Here's, let's say this is the book, and first of all, it's blotted out all the writing that was inside. It's all blotted out. The pages are clean on it. And then he takes it out of the way, and then he nails it to the cross. This is the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. If I said to you tonight, go away and find that book, I'll bet you a dollar you couldn't find it. Because there is no cross, and there'll never be another cross, because the Lord Jesus came into the, the world once to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And friend, if you come to the Lord Jesus tonight, he'll blot out your book, he'll take it out of the way, and he'll nail it to the cross. And when that book is nailed to the cross, you remember that they took the Lord Jesus and they nailed him by the hands, and they nailed him by the feet. And before they had him on the cross, they crowned him with thorns. And they ripped his back open with a, an old scourge. And when they nailed him to the cross, I'll tell you, all his precious blood started to flow down. And if that book of mine is nailed to the cross, I can tell you this, it's covered with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Not only is it blotted out, and not only is it taken out of the way, but it's nailed to his cross and it's covered with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what's on offer tonight. That's what an abundant pardon is. Some dear believers have doubts in their mind. And, you know, I made a profession, you know, and I asked the Lord to be my Savior, but, but I've made a mistake, and, and I think I've maybe got lost again. I'd like to know where the mistake you have made could be written down because the book has been blotted out, and it's been taken out of the way, and it's been nailed to the cross, and I'll tell you there's nowhere to write down what you have done. You see, that's what an abundant pardon is. And that's what's on offer in this meeting tonight, dear friend. If you come to the Lord, if you seek the Lord while he may be found, he will abundantly pardon. That's what's on offer. You'd be a fool not to take it, wouldn't you? Imagine somebody going along life's journey and ending up in the countless ages of eternity in hell, suffering torment day and night forever and ever and ever. And at the whole time, God was saying, look, I want to give you an abundant pardon. I want to take that book of yours that's going to condemn you to hell for all eternity, and I want to blot it out, and I want to take it out of the way, and I want to nail it to the cross, and I want to cover it in the precious blood. And of course, you're saying no. You're saying, I want to go to hell. 
I don't want the blood of Jesus Christ to take away my sins. I don't want God to deal with my book. I want to stand at the great white throne, and I want God to take me by the scruff of the neck, and I want God to cast me into the lake of fire forever. Ah, oh, friend, if you're not saved, you're a fool. You're a fool, because God's offering you an abundant pardon tonight. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 55 for a few moments. There's four things I want to notice in the text in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 6 and verse 7. First of all, I want you to notice the picture that is painted. The picture that is painted. I'm not much of a painter, but I want you to see the picture that is painted here. The very first words of Isaiah 55 and verse 6, they just say, Seek ye the Lord. Seek ye the Lord. Now, to make it possible for a sinner like me to seek the Lord, something miraculous had to happen first. There was no point coming along to a group of sinners and saying, Seek ye the Lord. If you couldn't tell them that the Lord had come, first of all, to seek them, that the Lord had made it possible for them to seek the Lord. I want you to see the picture that is painted. And we're going away back into the Garden of Eden, and I want you to picture the scene. It's, a, it's an absolutely beautiful place. It's a paradise garden, and God has made a man, and God has made a woman, and God has set them into the Garden of Eden. It's an absolutely perfect, perfect place. And then one day, of course, the old devil makes his way into the Garden of Eden, and he beguiles and he deceives Eve, and Eve commits a sin. She disobeys God. God had only given them one commandment. Remember in Genesis 2, verse 17, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is in the midst of the garden, thou shalt not eat of it, for the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And there you've got two absolutely perfect human beings, and you've just got one command from God, and they can't even keep it. I know people in Northern Ireland, I was going to say it in Gannon, but not particularly in Gannon, but I know people in Northern Ireland who are trying to keep Ten Commandments. They haven't a chance. They haven't a chance. And friend, if you're in the meeting tonight and you're trying to keep the Ten Commandments to get into heaven, you haven't a chance. No hope. Without Christ having no hope and without God in the world, that's what describes you tonight. You haven't a chance. You're Adam and Eve and they're absolutely perfect and they couldn't keep one commandment. And you have no chance of keeping ten. And of course, the devil comes and he deceives a woman and she sins. And when Eve sins, she only sinned against herself. It wasn't Eve's sin that brought sin into this world. It was Adam's sin that brought sin into the world. Four by one man's sin entered into the world. And Eve has sinned against the Lord and Adam comes along and he sees her and he knows that something has happened to her. He knows that she has lost her robe of splendor. Her, her, her life has been ruined by sin. And Adam makes a decision just there and then. He, he loves Eve more than he loves God. And he has to make a choice. Have I got paradise without her? Or a world of sin with her? And he loves her. He must love her so much. And the men are supposed to love their wives as Christ loved his church and gave himself for it. We're supposed to sacrificially love our wives. And Adam really loves his wife. It says in 1 Timothy 2 verse 14, And Adam was not deceived. He wasn't deceived. But Eve, being deceived, was in the transgression. Adam wasn't deceived. Adam made a conscious choice to be a sinner. He decided to be a sinner. He decided to allow sin into his life and into the world. And you and I have been affected by Adam's sin from that day to this. And dear friend, this is the reason why you have to decide to be saved. I know dear people and some friends of mine, and they believe if you belong to a certain company of people, they call it the elect. And they say, well, if you belong to this company of people whom Christ died for on the cross, you'll be saved automatically. Well, I can tell you, friend, you'll not be saved automatically. Because Adam decided to be a sinner, and you, the son of Adam, the daughter of Adam, have to decide to be a Christian. You've got to call upon the name of the Lord. There's something that you've got to do. And Adam decided to be a sinner. I want you to picture Adam and Eve, and they're both lost in their sin. Would there have been any point saying to them, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, call ye upon him while he is near? Not a bit. They wouldn't have known how to do it. They couldn't have got a ladder and made a ladder and went away up to heaven to find God. They couldn't have sought the Lord unless the Lord came first to seek them. And that's the picture I want you to see painted tonight. Because in Genesis chapter uh, 3 and verse 8, it says, And they heard... The voice of the Lord God walking 
in the garden in the cool of the day. And here's two lost sinners. And they're not interested in seeking the Lord. They're hiding. But I want you to hear the first sound that they heard was the voice of God. And friend, this is God coming down to seek and to save that which was lost. Here are two sinners and they wouldn't have known how to seek God. But God came down to seek them. And in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 9 it says, They hid themselves amongst the trees of the garden. And God said, Where art thou? And that's the second time that they heard the voice of God. It's an invitation. And friend, I have no doubt if you're not saved in the meeting that you're hearing the voice of God saying, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord for he will abundantly <coughs> pardon. You see, God came down to seek and to save that which is lost. When we come to Luke chapter 19, we find the Lord Jesus, and he's just seven days, perhaps eight days, from the cross at Calvary. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, the Lord Jesus said, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. The Lord Jesus is the seeking Savior. And because he has become the seeking Savior, you and I can seek the Lord while he may be found. And on the cross at Calvary, the seeking Savior became the suffering Savior. Then they crowned him with thorns and nailed him by the hands and by the feet. And through the darkness at Calvary, the Lord Jesus cried, It is finished. He became the sovereign Savior. And because he finished the work on the old rugged cross, he's able to save to the uttermost all that come and are gone by him. And if you come and trust him tonight, he will abundantly pardon. You can see the picture that is painted. We can only seek the Lord because... The Lord Jesus has first sought us. Look at Isaiah 55 and verse 6 again. I want you to see not just the picture that is painted. It's a picture of a seeking Savior coming down to where the sinners were and meeting them at the very point of their need, making himself available. And dear friend, the Lord has made himself available tonight. He's just a call away. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Now, I want you to see the problem that is stated, not just the picture that is painted, but the problem that is stated. Look at verse 6 again. It says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Now, you can see the word while in the text that appears twice. And that brings a problem into the text, doesn't it? Because, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. It suggests that there might be a time while he'll not be able to be found and while he'll not be near. There's a problem in the text. It's a time limit. You see, the Bible says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And the old devil, he wants to take out the word while out of the text. He wants you to think that you can get saved any time, any place, anywhere, under any circumstances. He wants you to think that there's no time limit to salvation. When we come to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, I think it might be verse 17, we read about the man called Esau. And Esau had come in from the hunting field, and he was quite hungry, and he sold his birthright, something that was eternal, for a bowl of pottage, something that was temporal. He gave away his right to the blessing. And Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 17 says, For when the time when he should have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. Now listen to this here. Because he found no place for repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. And I can see Esau was a big fellow, a good tight fellow he was. And I can see this big man on his knees, crying his eyes out, looking for forgiveness, but he found no place for repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He had flittered out his day of grace. Esau had left it too late. Esau had made his decision yesterday, and it's going to affect his tomorrow. And you can't just get saved when you want to get saved. Sometimes in my job, and your brother Bertie could tell you the same, somebody might ring you up and say, Pastor... My old uncle's dying in the hospital and he's not saved. I want you to go and see him and I want you to talk to him about the Lord and I want you to try and get him saved. He's dying. And you go along to the hospital and the nurses, they're scurrying around doing their best and there's pipes coming out of everywhere and there's wires and there's monitors and there's beepers and you're in trying to tell the man about the Lord Jesus Christ and next thing he's dead and he's in hell and it's too late for him because not everybody who hears the gospel gets saved. You see, the Bible says, Seek ye the Lord while 
he may be found. A friend, there's coming a day when the Lord Jesus will not be able to be found. It can happen in several different ways. First of all, it can happen if you die in your sins. The Lord Jesus said, if you die in your sins where I am there, ye cannot come. If you die in your sins, you will not be able to be saved. If the Lord Jesus comes again, I think somebody may be referred to it in their prayers as well. You see, the Bible says, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Friend, if the Lord Jesus came tonight, Every single truly born-again believer would leave the meeting, and every single sinner would stay in the meeting, and you would never be able to get saved. You would have an empty church. There'd plenty of Bibles lying about. You could read the hymn book. You could come up to the front. You could cry your eyes out. You could pray all you like, but you'll not be getting saved. If the Savior comes tonight, the day of grace for you will be over, and I could prove it, although I haven't time in the Word of God. You go home and read the book of Second Thessalonians. And you'll discover the people who are left behind will not be able to get saved. For this cause, it says in verse 11, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, for this cause, God shall send them strong delusions that they should believe the lie, who believe not the truth, but at pleasure in unrighteousness. Our oh, friend, God's going to deceive you into believing the lie, the Antichrist. Those who have sat in meetings like this and heard the gospel and know about the Savior and know about the sufferings of Christ and the precious blood that was shed, you'll never be able to get saved if Jesus comes. Oh, death could end your day of grace. The coming of the Lord Jesus could end your day of grace. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6 and 3 that my spirit shall not always strive with man. If the spirit stops talking to you, you can't get saved. You just can't get saved. This is why the problem is in the text. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. There's a possibility that you could waste away your day of grace and leave yourself lost in an old sinner's hell for all eternity. Come with me to Genesis chapter 7, please. I want you to see this because this became a reality for people who lived just before the flood. You'll perhaps know that the flood happened 1656 years after creation. So it's not a very, very long time in history, but it's just 1656 years. And sin had been going for 1656 years, and God looked down and he couldn't take any more. It says it repented the Lord that he had made man upon the earth. And God says to Noah, I want you to build an ark. And it's just an old square box, that's all it is. It's 450 feet long, and it's 75 feet wide, and it's 45 feet high. And it's pitched within and without with pitch. It's just an old black box. That's all it is. And it took them 120 years to beat it together. And while they made the ark, they preached the word of God. Noah preached righteousness for 120 years. Look at Genesis 7, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house unto the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. This was the day that Noah entered into the ark. You could see all the people in Noah's day and they laughed at him. They said, imagine that old boy. He's away into that old black box. It's just a coffin because the word ark and the word coffin is the same word. It's a coffin. And imagine him going into that old black coffin with all them animals. Sure, them animals will eat him. And they thought he was mad. But the door was open for seven days. I, I'm calling it the 24th of December. There's just seven days left. Look what it says in verse 4. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. It's the 24th of December. There's only seven days left. There's only 168 hours for them people to get into the ark. Just 168 hours. And during those seven days, Noah could have said, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. You look at verse 16. Verse 16 says, And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. See, that was it. It's now the 31st of December. The seven days of grace are over, and these people can't get saved anymore. You see, friend, that's why the text says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. 
The people outside the ark, they never considered the possibility that they might be too late. They never considered the possibility that God would actually pour out his wrath upon them. They, they, they would have said, well, God never done this before. God never judged us before. God never sent a flood before. Sure, it's not going to happen. It's just a myth. And they stood out for the 24th of December and the 25th of December, and they went to the 31st of December, and the door was shut, and that was it. You can see the problem that's stated in the text. A oh, friend, you could leave it till it's too late. You could die in your sins. You don't have to be old to die. About three months ago or less, I buried a wee girl. She was only 15. And just before that, I was at another funeral, and the wee girl was only 25. And I have uncles who were murdered by the IRA, and they weren't 40. And my friend, I can tell you, you don't have to be old to die in your sin. You don't. You could die in your sin, and you could never be saved. The Lord Jesus could stop speaking to you, and you'll never be saved. The Lord Jesus could come, and you'll never be saved. That's why the text says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Look at verse... <clears throat> Or six again of Isaiah chapter 55. You can see the picture that is painted. It shows us that there's a seeking Savior. And you can see the problem that's stated in the text. It, it tells us that we need to come now and trust the Lord Jesus while there's still time. I want you to see the path outlined in the text. Look what it says in verse 7. Isaiah 55 and verse 7. It says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord. You see, the path to salvation is a path of repentance. It is. I know there's very, very few places today that will be preaching repentance. But the Bible says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. You could almost hear the sinners, and I've heard this many, many times. Who do you think you are calling us wicked? I knocked the door in a wee town, it's just town, not that far from here. A number of years ago, and I knocked the door, and this lady came out. She was an elderly lady. She was a lovely-looking lady, an old lady. And I said, excuse me, dear, would you take a gospel track? She says, who do you think you are? She says, I'm the minister's wife. I says, that'll not do you much good at the great white throne. She slammed the door. She didn't want anybody telling her she was a sinner. But dear friend, here's what the Bible says. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And you might say, well, I'm not bad. You know, I don't do anybody any harm. I come along to church. I, I do my best. I, I keep the law the best I can. God says, you're wicked if you're not saved. You see, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And it's not until we agree with God. You see, most people in Ulster tonight, they say that God has got it wrong about me. Remember the Pharisee in Luke chapter 18 and he goes into the temple and he goes in to pray and he's a religious man and he says, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men. What he's saying is this. He says, God, you've got it wrong about me. You say that everybody's wicked, they're unrighteous, they're lost, they're guilty, they're filthy sinners, but, but not me. God, you've got it wrong about me. Because I pray twice in the week, or I fast twice in the week, and I, I give a tenth of all that I have, and I'm not unjust, and I'm not an adulterer, and I'm not an extortionist, and I'm not like that other fellow over there. He's a publican. And he just says, God, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You see, there's a path outlined in the text. It's a path of repentance. And if you're not willing to agree with God as to what you are, then you'll never be saved. You see, the Lord Jesus said in Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, and he said it again in verse 5. And you don't have to go to Bible college to sort this out. I have never been at Bible college, and I can understand this the best. Here's what it says. The Lord Jesus said, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. What do you think that means? If you went to Bible college, they might tell you that it didn't mean that. But that's what the Lord Jesus said. Except ye repent, you'll perish. What do you think that means? It means if you don't repent, you'll perish. The path to salvation is the path of repentance. And friend, we're living in the day when the sinner, he wants to go to heaven, yes. I remember doing outreach down south in a little village called Bukrana, and we asked the people at the door, uh, would you like to go to heaven? Oh, yes, we would. Would you like to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior? No, we wouldn't. You see... People want to go to heaven, but they want to have their sin at the same time. You can't have it. You can't have your cake and eat it. 
If you want to be in God's heaven, if you want God's Son as your Savior, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. There's got to be a turning away from sin. You can see the path outlined in the text. I want you to look at the end of the text. I want you to see the pardon offered in the text. The time is gone. I just want to finish here. It says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts, for he will abundantly pardon. That's the pardon offered in the text. Friend, if you're not saved, you're further down the broad road than you've ever been before. You're closer to the edge of hell. And God is saying, look, I want to abundantly pardon you. I want to take that book that all your sins are written in and I want to blot it out. I want to take it out of the way. I want to nail it to the cross and I want to cover it in the precious blood. Look at the text, what it says. It says, for he will abundantly pardon. You can see that God does it. This is not something you do yourself. Sure, you couldn't. If I could forgive myself, I'd do it, but I couldn't. Most people can't even forgive themselves anyway. Some old sin in the past, and they, they can't even forgive themselves one single sin. Oh, this is God that does it. He will abundantly pardon. There's a verse in, I think it's Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 14. It says, For whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. If God pardons you tonight, I'll tell you it'll be forever. That's an eternal pardon. That's an abundant pardon. You can see that God does it. You can see that God promises it. He says, for he will abundantly pardon. That's a promise from God. You seek the Lord tonight, he'll abundantly pardon you. You can see that God described it as an abundant pardon. It's just as good as you can get. You can't get any better than this. And friend, I want you to see the word pardon. And God does it and God promises it and God describes it, but you need it because you're guilty. See, in Romans chapter 3 and verse 19, it says that the whole world become guilty before God. And because we're guilty, we need a pardon. And God is offering you a pardon tonight on the strength of what Jesus Christ did on Calvary's cross. Because the blood has been shed, because the work has been finished, because the Savior has risen victorious over sin and death and hell, God's offering you an abundant pardon tonight. There's no small print no hidden cost, no religious requirement. You've just got to come and agree with God as to what you are. God, I'm a sinner. And I'm turning away from all my sin and I'm trusting Jesus Christ as my Savior. And the promise is this, he will abundantly pardon. And may the Lord bless his word to your hearts.